Yeah. We'll start with figuring out what does health look like for me physically, mentally, emotionally, and work really hard on being good at you. Healthy mind, healthy body, healthy life. Soul Foods on Smooth 98.1. Love music and love life. We are smooth 98.1, one minute past eight o'clock. You are listening to Soul Food and every Saturday morning from eight till 8.30, we discuss issues and things related to your health and wellness. Today, we would like to educate you on the topic of dyslexia because the month of October, like I mentioned earlier, is International Dyslexia Month. And the aim is to raise awareness about the condition, how you can diagnose it, how you can be managed, what it does to an individual, the risk factors, the severity, and many other things involved. And so we want you to be balanced in your education of the topic. And to do that, you know, we always bring an expert because we would like you to have the best of the information. But before I tell you who my guest is, you can have the first-hand information if you go to our YouTube channel. That is youtube.com forward slash smooth 981 FM Lagos. That allows you to see our faces. It allows you to share the stream with someone. It allows you to save it so that you can go back to it later on. And of course, you can drop your questions, your comment, and your take in the chat option. So you can use the live chat option and we will take them. Then there is a WhatsApp line as well where you can drop your comment 0809-444-0981. Again, 0809-444-0981. And of course, the call line is 01448-9981. I see the phone line ringing. I'm not sure why now because we're yet to get started on the discussion. But like I mentioned, we have an expert who is joining us, someone who is quite passionate, that I'm about to understand how she came into this passionate advocacy for dyslexia. I'm referring to the managing director of Dysle Dyslexia Nigeria, and that is Dr. Adrian Tikolu. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I am well, thank you. And thank you for being my guest this morning. Thank you for having me. So before we go to the basics and understanding what dyslexia is, I am curious how you got onto this path. Why dyslexia? How did you come into the advocacy of it? Awesome, thank you. So I'm an educator. I've been an educator for about 40 years. And in the span of that time, I've also run a school and I have come across several children that are quite smart and have had difficulty with reading and learning and I couldn't understand it. There was a particular boy that came up to me some time ago and said, Mrs. Nicolo, would I ever be able to learn to read? And that really got me because I know he was very smart. He was very good with his hands. He could do so many things, but he just had difficulty reading. And so I just started doing my investigation research. How can I help this child and others? And I started the journey of dyslexia. So I started reading up and then going abroad, taking training and coming back. And my first um, point of contact was reading recovery. And I started using reading recovery with this child. And the difference was just phenomenal. And I just wondered how just tweaking things a little bit could make such a difference. So of course I started, you know, working with a small group of children and the results were remarkable. And then I'll tell other school owners, you know, this is what I did, this is what I did. And then I started getting a lot of people coming to say, what should I do? How should I do this? And I thought, look, I need to go beyond just this, my small sphere. And it, it, that was basically what really led to the, the start of dyslexia in Nigeria. Mm. Thank you for heeding that call and deciding to start something that is way beyond you. So let uh, somebody understand exactly what this life or train tongue twister of a word is. What <laughs> is dyslexia? Well, thank you. Let me break down the word first. So it's um, it's a Latin word and it's of two parts, dys and lexia. 
this meaning difficulty with alexia means words so it's basically difficulty with words it's not such a huge word after all you know so dyslexia is a neurobiological inheritance and i say neurobiological because it has something to do with the way the brain is processing something so a neurobiological inheritance that can affect the skills for reading writing spelling basically language processing but not just that it also comes with some strengths even though we talk about the difficulty a lot more than the strengths so it's a it's a language processing issue that can affect all the skills required for acquiring reading, writing, spelling, comprehension skills. Mm. Thank you. Now you have mentioned that it is language processing. So I want to assume that if we're looking at the signs and symptoms, it definitely manifests itself in difficulty reading. Absolutely. Speech, reading, writing, you know, so all the ways we express language. Mm. Now, the question is, how do you spot these things? How are you sure that it's dyslexia? It's not something else in a child, especially when you have them saying, you know, it's possible that a parent thinks you're just being slow or you are not being sharp in quotes, not being intelligent. So what are the other telltale things that can make you know that this is something that requires the diagnosis of an expert and then leading to the diagnosis? Okay, so um, first thing actually is dyslexia does not affect intelligence. And so you find that a dyslexic child or person has average to high intelligence. So you're wondering, this child is quite smart, very good, you know, communicating, good with his hands, good with sports music and so many other things. But he's finding difficulty with reading and language. And sometimes that's the first pointer because dyslexia uh, manifests as a difficulty, like I said, with reading. But you can also see the signs much earlier. Dyslexia is inherited. It means it's with you from the day you were born. Okay, so you've gotten the genes from your parents or your grandparents somewhere. And so some of the signs are much earlier, even before you start to learn to read, like you would find a child having difficulty with rhyming, just you know, the nursery rhymes, and it has difficulty with rhyming words. It would have difficulty with acquiring the alphabet, you know, learning the alphabet. So his ABCs and then the sounds of the alphabet would be difficult. Now you'd expect that he'd be able to do that because it's quite smart as a child, but then he would have difficulty with his alphabet. He would also have difficulty with his handedness. So today he might use his right hand, tomorrow he might use his left hand. It's like it's confused. You know, which hand, you know, which hand should I use when writing? So sometimes you find that before they learn to, to read at all. Also, you'd find that they don't like anything to do with books. They don't mind if you read to them, but they're not interested in picking up a book and reading it or looking at the pictures. They want to do something else, dismantle your phone, probably break up a toy car or something. So those are some of the early signs. And then some of them have delayed speech because dyslexia does affect language. And so sometimes you have delayed speech and the child isn't speaking. It's two years old, you're getting worried. It's probably even getting to three and a few words and they're all mumbled up. So eventually it gets on to speaking, but he has a delayed speech. So those are the early signs. And then from there you get into when he's in nursery, when you really expect that he has the, the, the desire to hold a pen and write. Usually they don't like to write, you know, come and hold your pencil, write this. And he, he doesn't want to have anything to do with that. He's still having difficulty with his alphabet. Um, still ambidextrous, not sure which handedness. And that goes on for a while, but you really don't you know, know anything other than that. But when you get to beginning to put the sounds together, so you have the sound for cat as k, a. So he now knows the sounds, but then put the sounds together, what we call blending, then that becomes a problem. So he would learn k, a, t, and then he would say bag, for instance. He would just have difficulty blending the sounds together. And then once he's been able to do that, and that can take some time, 
you know, longer than other children that don't seem to have a difficulty. Then you would find that he has difficulty saying the words and reading, you know, with a speed that allows for comprehension. So he would, his reading would be choppy. He would uh, be very slow. It would take his time. And at the end of the day, say in primary one, when you expect that he has read a sentence, now tell me what's the meaning? What have you read? He won't remember because then comprehension would become a problem. So these problems can carry on usually with spelling. You know, spelling, they can invert their letters. They can invert words. So he could read a word like saw on the page and the next page he'll read it as was. He would just invert the entire word. Sometimes he would have tracking problems. He would skip a line when he's reading. And you wonder, you on this line, or you find he's using his fingers to trace the line because he knows he's going to skip the line. He doesn't know how he does it, but he's going to skip a line. Sometimes they have uh, problems with the letters. It appears like the letters are jumping around on the paper. But then ultimately they have difficulty with reading because all of these problems compound the issue. They're unable to marry letters and sounds together. And so, you know, decoding a word becomes difficult. So when they find new words, they stumble on the words when they're reading. And so reading is very difficult. They still have no desire to read. They have all sorts of avoidance tactics when it comes to reading. You know, I want to go to the toilet. I need to sharpen my pencil. There's always something going on but reading. So you'd find that they're not interested in reading because it's difficult. And there are other signs as well, especially in primary, they have difficulty copying from the board, for instance. So he's probably the one that is, everybody has finished writing their notes. He's still trying to copy. He's still on the first two lines. You wonder what he's been doing all day. Um, he, again, he might have difficulty with numbers as well because dyslexia can co-occur with dyscalculia. So he might have difficulty with numbers. Um, he would have difficulty with handwriting, again, Putting the, the sounds in written form becomes also a problem. So handwriting can also be quite poor. But you find ultimately they have difficulty with comprehension. Now, when they get into the secondary school, you then find other more profound difficulties if you haven't done anything. For instance, then he would really have avoidance tactics. He would have a problem with organization, can't put his ideas down on paper. We have wonderful ideas. Let's talk about our holiday, beautiful ideas. But when it comes to writing it down, probably has a problem with spelling. He can't organize his thoughts. And you just find he's written two lines from all these beautiful ideas. So his writing is really poor. He might have memory issues, especially working memory. So he doesn't remember a lot of the things that he's been taught. Um, he does remember instructions. So there are different signs as you go along, you know, but basically it relates to language, would relate to memory in some organization and other concentration and attention. But all of this would mean that the child might not achieve as well as is capable. Because when you're in primary, early primary, you learn to read. When you get to like primary four, grade four, you should make a switch to reading to learn. You must be able to read on your own. So your parents would say, go to your room, go to the study and go and read. And then you would find that um, they're not assimilating, they're not concentrating, their minds have wandered off. You know, they say he left the room, you know, he's drifted off, he's daydreaming. But a lot of the times, because he's having difficulty with the words itself and understanding what he's read then, you know, his mind isn't really there. He's thinking of something else. So he goes into the exam and it does really poorly. And you're wondering, he spends all these hours reading. You know, he seems to know it, goes into the exam while and he flunked it. So he's not doing as well. This left here is lifelong because it is inherited. So there are different signs at different stages of life. In the workplace, you can find it more with comprehension. He's learned to read, but he can't read as quickly so he needs to read the material over and over and over again to grasp, you know, the gist of the of the paper. Um, he would probably have time management problems. Again, still have memory issues. They're standing in front of his boss or supervisor and they're giving him instructions. 
and he, he just doesn't remember them. And so, you know, the problems are there when it comes to language processing as you go along, and more so when nothing is done when you're young. Wow, I have no words. I mean, I'm hearing all of those and I'm thinking of a parent who is so confused, who has no idea what is going on with a child, or maybe an educator, a teacher, who has tried and tried and is just frustrated, or maybe a religious person who thinks, are you possessed or are you just dull or is something wrong? I can imagine the amount of frustration these people go through just because they have no clue of what is going on with that child. Now, and you want to imagine the frustration with the child. Nobody seems to understand that it's that difficult. I mean, it's like you have what we call the spaghetti scenario. You have bowls of spaghetti and you call the children, you give all of them forks and, you know, turn it around, twirl it around your fork and you're good to go. But some children will have a spoon and, you know, they would try over and over and over again to lift this spaghetti and it will keep falling off. It's not that they are incapable of eating the spaghetti. They don't have the right tools. And you haven't made it easy because you've given them the same form as someone that has a fork. So imagine the degree of frustration that they also go through. That is just so sad. Well, before we get to how it is managed and how a person can be helped, I'm curious, you've mentioned that it is genetic, it is inherited. What are the general causes? How does a person turn off dyslexic? So, it, it, like I said, you inherit the gene. The scientists have isolated the gene that, you know, relates to dyslexia. I think we need to say here first that dyslexia is not a problem. It is a, it's a difference. And like we're all different as human beings, the way we look, the way our hair texture is, our eye color, we inherit those genes. It, it's just a difference for instance, a variation in the population. So you inherit the gene from your parents. It's not something that the parent has done wrong or, you know, you took alcohol when you were pregnant or this or that. No, it is just, it's, it's inherited and it comes with great strengths as well. So what you, you don't have with language processing or the difficulty, you make up for in other areas. And that's the beauty of specific learning difficulties is that you might have difficulty in an area, but specific strengths in other areas as well. You know, so uh, I, I don't want us to see it just as a difficulty. So the problem is we can't identify dyslexia. A lot of the teachers can't. And then even when they do, we focus on the difficulty and then we don't harness the strengths that come naturally to dyslexic, like problem solving, thinking outside the box. I mean, a dyslexic will sit in a meeting and they'll be the one telling you, no, this is what's gonna happen if you go down this route. This is what's gonna happen. They see the end. Many times they come up with results, you know? So, but they're bogged down in school by language processing and because teachers teach in basically one way and they learn differently. So it's just inherited. Okay, so you could have acquired dyslexia but then you would have learned to read and write and have no problem growing up. You might have an accident that results in trauma to a particular part of the brain. And then you could have, you know, what we call acquired dyslexia because you then could have difficulty with reading. You know, you could have read perfectly before and suddenly you're back to, you can't even, you know, tell the sounds. So that's acquired dyslexia. But for the most part, when we talk about dyslexia, it's inherited. You know, it's a propensity for some strengths and some difficulties. Thank you so much for this education. Thank you. And Cruz on WhatsApp says, wow, is the appropriate response. Or more, I am dazed. Things that society just bits the child for not knowing is a very serious condition. And then I have Ali who says, Good morning, Nogwashim. Always a very engaging program. Absolutely. Very interesting topic. With all of these points given about dyslexia, it makes, makes me think about dementia at old age. So I want to ask your guest, are dyslexic people prone to dementia at old age? Oh, no, 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 not at all. Dementia is um, it's a degenerative um, disorder. Dyslexia is, like I said, is a learning difference. 
It's what you're born with. It, you, you don't have a propensity towards a particular ailment. I mean, I could have blue eyes. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't make me a candidate for a particular ailment in later years. So no, it's not related at all. All right, thank you. Let me take a call. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What's your name and location? I'm Madhu from Chulere. Thank you for calling. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, the topic is very interesting. You see, my son, my son is now long, he's about six years, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't do much in school. He just comes to school and comes to school and comes to school and comes to school when he was in primary school. When he got to the higher institution, when he got to the secondary school, he couldn't even do more. Even the higher institution, he couldn't do more. But I think he's good in another, another, so that he's his own child now. I'm seeing the trait of something like, something like what the professional is talking about uh, in your video. His own child, his own daughter now, having kind of that trait. It's slow learning. I think a child is about two and a half years now and cannot really speak our language, uh, any language, even English, even Yoruba. I couldn't even speak. So I'm really, I, I want to, if you can tell a, a different, genetic different, and then uh, it, 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 it can be compensated in another world. So this is a very really hard now. So I, I want to know more and I want to. Get that telephone number so I can reach out. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing. We'll say that at the end of the show. All right. So we can as well get to the diagnosis as well as the the treatment and management. I mean, you've touched up on the diagnosis already. Well, um, again, I would like to say not a treatment. You know, dyslexia is not a disease. It's not a problem per se. Of course, it does come with difficulty with reading, writing, and spelling which unfortunately is how we learn in school, so it makes school really difficult. Um, some of the basic things to do is to find it early. You know, um, if there were ever a, a treatment in quotes, it would be early diagnosis, you know, so you need to find it early. And some of the things you can do is to do a screening so for, for schools, a child comes into your school newly or either all those that are coming into grade one or into GS1 or new student, just do a basic dyslexia screening for them. That would tell you those that are showing the risk factors for dyslexia. I mean, for the difficulties that may come with dyslexia, especially when it comes to reading. So you'd already know. Uh, of course, there are some screeners out there, but a screener is only as good as a person using it. So. It's good to still reach out to a professional that can do a screening. So you screen generally what we call universal or across board screening. Beyond that, you can then do a full diagnostic assessment, which is in the place of a professional. So you cannot diagnose dyslexia unless you're specifically trained to do that. And then diagnosis takes about three to four hours you know, the test itself, and it looks at several areas that relate to language processing. After that diagnosis, you then get, you know, like a report, and you then have the diagnosis itself, and then recommendations for going forward, what you need to be doing. I have to say that no two dyslexics are exactly the same, because there are several areas of difficulty, and they all manifest in different ways with different persons. So you could have a person have a mild dyslexia because dyslexia can run on its continuum. So you can have mild dyslexia, moderate dyslexia, severe dyslexia. So where the person's rest or lies when you do the assessment is what informs the intervention that you then put in place. But, you know, if schools just learn how to teach dyslexic children, and then just use that to teach everyone else, because what works for dyslexics work even better for non-dyslexics. Everybody would be fine. If we truly mm. paid attention to meeting the needs of all the children, everyone would be fine. You know, so what can we do to ensure that all the children in our school are learning and not just paying lip service to that? When a child is showing difficulty, take action immediately. Screen these children, 
take action, put in place structured literacy, multi-sensory learning, and most of the time they just they just do so well and they do better than most because they do have great strengths, they do have resilience, they are trying hard, they've been frustrated almost all their lives, they know how to be a sticker, you know, so all you need to do is tweak it a little bit and they'll be fine. But when we don't do that, then we have serious problems with mental health, you know, with achievement in school. We have problems even when they leave school with finding work, they operate below their potential. Because if I'm capable of achieving nine out of 10, but all I was able to get at school was four out of 10, there's no way that I can reach my potential. And these individuals have great potential. You should see the array of people that are out there doing great things that are professional, that are dyslexic. One in five person is dyslexic is very common. 20% of any population is dyslexic. And, and so everywhere, there's a dyslexic in every family, in every classroom, in every school. But yet we're not doing that much. Imagine the number of people that are operating below their potential. They haven't found themselves. So do a screening, do a diagnostic assessment. And, you know, that way you can support all the children. Thank you very much. Sounds to me that we need to have teachers or educators who are not just doing the job because they want to earn them, but are genuinely interested in the growth and development of children. And I dare say that is hard to find because sometimes some people just want to get the money. They don't really care that much. I agree with you, but you know, we can get around that. If we made learning about specific learning difficulties a big part of their education when they're in school, for instance, teacher training colleges, if you go into the curriculum, they're doing next to nothing about these difficulties they're going to find in schools. If they knew about it, trust me, they would do more. Teachers are oblivious. They are in the dark. So they're seeing the signs of dyslexia in the classroom. The teachers are also frustrated because they're trying hard to help this child that is otherwise smart. They don't know what to do. They don't have the skill set. So they need to do pre-employment training in schools. They need to do in-service training. Once they get into schools as well, schools must put money to training their teachers so they can deliver on the promise to the child and the parent and ultimately to society. So yes, some people and a lot of people are in there for the money, but trust me, if they knew how to, they would. You wouldn't see a child that's having problems right in front of you and you know what to do and you wouldn't do it. Half the time is because, well, they don't know what to do. This one must be an oludo. He's just lazy. He's just playful. You know, his parents give him too much or all he likes is food or cartoons. You, you just comfortably label the child and put him aside. And you lock away that potential that society needs. You know, Thank you. Going oh, go forward, ahead, please. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, if you look at what we need for the future, the skills we needed for work for the future creativity, innovation, you know, um, all of these skills that come natural to the dyslexic person, thinking outside the box, look at artificial intelligence, is all creativity, it's all innovation. And these people have it naturally, and yet we're letting schools bug them down. I'm sorry, I get too passionate sometimes, you know, but let me let you. <laughs> That is totally fine. I mean, we appreciate this amount of understanding you've given to us on the topic. And on WhatsApp, William says, my son is dyslexic and I only found out from Google after feeling helpless. After much reading, I think I'm doing a good job managing him. Nice topics. Topic, thanks always. Thank you for sharing that, William. And like your passion, you have, I think you have a uh, Another education session coming up, your conference, your, what's it called, dialogue, I think. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. So the third Africa Dyslexia Dialogue will be coming up next Saturday via Zoom. Everyone can join. You know, it's, it's, it's free. It's a weekend and it's virtual. So it's an opportunity to just learn so much more about dyslexia. We have experts from all over the world speaking. And, and I'm sure that a lot of people will 
get to learn so much more. So yes, thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Adrian. It's been my pleasure and of course that of the listeners as well for taking the time to educate us on something that is so common and so underdiagnosed, I think, because many people see it, but they don't know what it is. Now, for exactly. people to catch up more on what you do and check you out on social media, where do they go to? Thank you so much. On Instagram, Facebook, at Dyslexia Nigeria. On our website, www.dyslexianigeria.com. And there they can get all our WhatsApp numbers, our phone numbers, and all the contact details. All right, our thank you. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you, Dr. Adrian. It's been so wonderful. And again, thank you for being our guest this morning. I guess some other time we could have another part of this conversation that education never stops reading. So absolutely. I'd, I'd love to. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And do you have a lovely morning. And you too. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Oh, wow. Thank you for listening. And this is why I always say kindness is important because, again, you're not quite sure of what is going on with that person or with that child. So it's just a little bit of consideration. Put yourself in their shoes sometimes, even if you have no a little patience, a little tolerance, a little kindness will go a long way. And you never can tell you will make such a huge difference that you might be feeling that person's hope and energy to just face life and continue especially when it looks like they are the odd one out in court or they are not understood. So please, in whatever ways that you can, spread kindness. And most importantly, I hope that you on your own experience kindness so that you can give it out and share it as well. You have been listening to So Good on Smooth 98.1 and my guest has been Dr. Adrienne Tikulu. She is the Managing Director of Dyslexia Nigeria. We're going to break and when we come back as is our fashion on Saturdays, 8.40, the children will be joining us on Curious Minds for them to spell and win themselves goodie bags from our sponsors. This is Smooth Naughty Point One. Thank you. I mean, I can't thank you enough. It was so good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Take care then.